Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Better Building Space Condition Technology Team uh, webinar today. Uh, and we're going to get started right away. So I'm going to hand it over to Miles to start the webinar today. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Okay, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Miles Hayes. We've got Mark Bianchi here. He's the uh, N19 research engineer and uh, leads the space conditioning technical research team. Um, I support the research team, and then Michael Drew is here with NREL, and he's going to be our speaker today um, speaking about um, the cooling tower uh, water treatment. Um, we're going to start off on the agenda here. We're going to go through some HVAC research team updates. Um, and then we'll dive right in. Um, just a reminder of the upcoming Better Buildings Summit, uh, June 8th or 10th in uh, Arlington. Please uh, go to that website and, and uh, join and attend. It's a great, great event, and we encourage everyone to attend. All right, just kind of um, highlighting a few of the recent publications. Um, uh, evaluation of the high rudder pole switch reluctance motor and control condenser fans for commercial refrigeration systems. Um, planning for failure, end of life strategies for HVAC systems. The GSA guidance for cooling towers. Energy performance validation of gaseous air cleaning technology for commercial buildings. Um, provider and user perspective on automated fault detection and diagnostics products for packaged rooftop units. That's sort of a phase one um, with a phase two portion coming soon. Um, and then we, the testing and evaluation of chemical free cooling water treatment, which you'll hear a little bit about today. Um, looking ahead, um, we're completing our analysis of rooftop unit AFD with uh, several partners in industry. So we'll be having that published later this year. And then we're sort of looking for some feedback <clears throat> on a few uh, topics that we're hoping that uh, we can work with the Better Buildings Group on, um, specifically thermal energy storage. Um, we'd really like to sort of spend this year putting together uh, the groundwork for a sort of thermal energy storage guide. But we're really looking for um, your feedback, what, what is important to you, um, what works well if you're using thermal energy storage, um, you know, what can we do to help support uh, the adoption of thermal energy storage in your facility. Um, and then there's, I think, one more bullet there. And then uh, lastly, <clears throat> um, we've got uh, some ideas uh, stirring around. Similarly, we'd like to work with a better buildings group on uh, BAS to GEBS um, sort of building automation system and tying that to the grid interactive efficient buildings of the future. Um, really looking at getting your feedback, what's important. Um, what are your, you know, what are your plans in your facility for integrating this technology? What would you like to know from us? Um, really utilizing the, the better buildings relationship to highlight um, different strategies that work well in this field. Um, and as many of you are probably already familiar with um, our HVAC resource map, we'd like to just highlight that again. Check out the website; it's a great, uh, great tool. Um, for you to use to identify different strategies for improving efficiencies in your mechanical systems. And uh, Miles, what um, updates were done recently? Can you highlight? Um, since the last webinar, there there have been a few updates. Um, terminal air units. I think we expanded a little bit on the fans. There's going to be uh, some some additions coming soon from the labs group, um, where we'll be adding um, more to the website specific to lab environments. Um, I'm not sure when that's slated to come out. All right. All right, so uh, again, this is Michael DeRue, and uh, I'm gonna cover some uh, efforts that we did on cooling tower water treatment systems. Um, so we've tested several systems over the last few years, and um, We've wrapped up most of those. We still actually have a couple more ongoing. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues here at NREL that, that did a, the, 
the bulk of this work actually. Um, Jesse Dean, Greg Tomberlin, Dylan Cutler, Jennifer Da, um, for all their great work in this effort. So, um, but I want to let's back up a little bit. Why why do we care about um, water? Um, well, one reason is the cost. So, if you look at the consumer price index of water and sewer costs, um, it's it's gone up dramatically over the last, um, you know, since about 1986 here. Um, and it's gone up over 400%, more than double the, the you know, energy services um, and, and all other, you know, costs. So, and um, it's not expected to stop going up, right? It's, it's going to keep going up. Um, and it's very regional dependent. So if you look at a map, I don't have a map of the U.S. here, but um, you know some areas um, in the Midwest are very low cost. Like Chicago is actually relatively low cost, but if you look at Pittsburgh, it has very high cost. Um, if you look at uh, the Northwest, Seattle area has very high cost, and 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 then um, so it's it's really regional dependent. Um, but they're definitely going up. All right, so let's talk about cooling towers. So what is a cooling tower? Um, so some of this is, you know, many of you know this already, but I just wanna start from basics here. We use evaporation of water to reject heat. And normally that we have this heat exchanger on the right-hand side that we have maybe in our chiller or a process cooling water system. Uh, but we use cooling towers because it's a very effective way of rejecting heat. Um, so evaporation of water um, has, a, has a lot of energy in it. So if we take about a one pound of water and evaporate it, we'll, that's equal to about a thousand BTUs. And um, so that's a significant amount of energy. And if you're looking at um, for every ton hour of heat rejection, um, it's about 1.8 gallons of water, um, and that ends up being a significant amount of water consumption in a in an office building or a hotel or a you know or a hospital that has large cooling towers. Um, it can be you know more than especially in an office building. It could be you know more than 50% of your your water consumption over the year, um, and so. We're interested in ways to to manage that water consumption, and um, we can attack it in a couple ways. One is um, with water treatment, um, so that we can, you know, we're we're trying to minimize that makeup water, and that's equal to your evaporation and your blowdown and your drift. Drift is usually very small, and we neglect it normally, um, but we can impact. Uh, through water treatment systems, what I'm going to talk today through today about is we can we can manage minimize that flow down. Um, the other way, and I'm not going to talk about this today though, is if you minimize your cooling load, you're going to minimize the amount of heat you need to reject, and uh, that would impact the evaporation part of that equation. So always go for efficiency, uh, but we're not talking about that today. Um, so. When we do evaporate the water in the cooling tower, it, it concentrates all the, the minerals and the chemicals and, and other uh, dissolved solids in, in the cooling tower and specifically in the, in, the, in the tower basin. And that can cause problems. So we, we look at ways to, to manage that. And in typical way is we, we use some kind of water treatment program, usually a chemical-based system to control the scale and the corrosion and the biological growth and the fouling. All right, so here we have those four uh, issues that we're trying to manage and balance, and it's very challenging because they're all interconnected. Um, and so um, we 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 apply a bunch of different methods. And um, so just starting out with scale, um, obviously scale um, is going to reduce your heat transfer because it's building up uh, on your heat transfer surfaces and and adds a resistance to that heat transfer. It can also, you know, if it gets bad enough, it can start to plug orifices, orifices and reduce flow rates. Um, it can also provide sites 
um, for bacteria growth and, and corrosion activity. And, um, and, but um, a small amount of scale or small amount of minerals in the system for sure is good. We want to, it, it actually helps reduce corrosion a little bit. Um, so for controlling that, we use scale inhibitors um, and uh, we add acid maybe sometimes to reduce the pH because that um, interrupts the, the chemical um, activities that are going on and reduces your formation of calcium carbonate um, and forms calcium sulfate, which you can remove from the system, but you're adding an acid. So people may want to re remove, uh, reduce that. You can also remove minerals through different methods. We'll talk about those today. Um, definitely you need to have your balanced chemistry and then you blow down what you can't um, get rid of. Uh, biological growth obviously doesn't sound like a good thing and it's not. Um, so it's a potential health hazard. Um, I'm sure many of you, we've all heard of Legionnaire's disease. Um, so uh, it's not a good, really want to avoid that and other um, problems. Um, also biological, you know, biofouling um, can reduce heat transfer. Um, it can cause biocorrosion um, and it's usually not a good thing. So you control it with the addition of biocide, um, balance your chemistry again, reduce light. Um, sunlight um, helps bio bacteria grow. Um, and you also, you know, keep your tower clean. So you do a lot of cleaning. Um, uh, corrosion, obviously corrosion is going to uh, weaken your system, um, cause pitting or general corrosion. It can reduce your heat transfer. It can also provide sites for biological growth. Um, there's no good, nothing good about corrosion. Um, so we add corrosion inhibitors. We do balanced chemistry um, and we do blowdowns and, and those kind of things. Um, and we, uh, yeah, really, the chemistry is really challenging to keep balance. Um, fouling is just, um, it can be biological or corrosive or um, just particles that are in your system that settle on um, your surfaces in, in your tower. Um, and really it can, you know, it's going to reduce your heat transfer. It's, it again, provides sites for corrosion activity and bacteria growth. Um, and you just really got to keep your system clean, avoid uh, growing all the, your bad things in your, in your system. But the ch it's really challenging to maintain that proper balanced water chemistry. It takes a lot of effort to um, maintain that and control it. And you're constantly monitoring your system to, to, to do a good job. And, and cooling towers are notorious for being ignored. Um, some people do a great job of maintaining them, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort. So, um, so let's talk about cycles of concentration a little bit, that it's the ratio of the concentration of dissolved solids or some other chemical um, species in your blowdown versus your makeup water. And so when I say blowdown, I mean your, your tower basin water. Um, and so this, you could, you could do a cycles of concentration on calcium or hardness or um, silica or, you know, any of these things. Um, conductivity, but you can also, it's approximately equal to your makeup water divided by your blowdown water. And a typical tower, you're going to see concentrations of like two and a half to seven, maybe. Um, and the graph on the right there shows the blowdown water in, in thousands of gallons a year um, versus cycles of concentration. So you can see if you starting at uh, two and a half there, um, you, you have a, a lot of water consumption. But if you can reduce that, um, you quickly save a lot of water. So if you can cut it down to, you know, 10 or, or, or I'd not cut down, if you can increase your cycles of concentration to like 10 or 15, um, you really get a significant water savings. 
Um, beyond that, your your uh, savings are diminished because um, you've already got the bulk of the savings getting it in that first few cycles of concentration. All right, so we tested four, um, some people call them alternative water treatment technologies, um, and we tested these over uh, the last like six years, five or six years. Um, and these were tested with the GSA GPG program and, and the DOE um, HIT program or High Impact Technology program. So it was four technologies, um, five buildings. Um, so the first technology was, was more of a typical chemical treatment technology, but it, it included this strong scale inhibitor. Um, and then they added on this side stream filtration. Um, and we'll talk about that. That was tested here in, in Colorado um, at, in an office building, um, you know, fairly large office building um, with, you know, almost 13, almost 1400 tons of cooling capacity. Um, and the next one was a salt based water softening system, um, also tested at an office building uh, and actually a la office lab combination building here in, in Colorado. Um, and then an advanced oxidation potential system. And the last one was an electrolysis system that we tested actually in Savannah, Georgia and Los Angeles, California. And I'm going to go into more details of each of these systems. All right. So the first system was this chemical water treatment system uses, a, as I said, a very strong scale inhibitor. Um, and then um, had very tightly controlled uh, automated um, feed of the scale inhibitor and the corrosion inhibitor and the biocide. Um, and again, this was, you know, more of a typical type of uh, water treatment system, but we were able to increase that the cycles of a concentration up to, you know, between 13 and 18. Um, based on monitoring that total dissolved solids in the system. Um, and then the filter, which is not shown in this uh, diagram, but there was a filter um, that was backwashed for 30 seconds once a day, uh, which is about 300 gallons. But that was, seems like a lot, but it was more than made up by increasing that cycles of concentration. So, um, Again, we we're able to get that cycles of concentration up to between 13 and 18, and there was a significant reduction in blowdown. Um, I think this building in the originally, you know, started a little over, you know, around two and a half um, cycles of concentration. So significant savings there. Um, and then uh, there was able to reduce the scaling um, quite a bit um, and improve the water quality. And then I also want to talk about this. We were able in Colorado, we actually have very good um, conditions often for what we call free cooling uh, of the system. So we were able to get like a water side economizer operation of the cooling tower and use that and use the cooling tower for providing the cooling to the building instead of the chiller. So while that increased the water consumption overall, um, it actually, um, you know, re had a significant reduction on energy because if you can reduce your chiller runtime, you have a, a great energy savings there. So, all right. Uh, the second system is this water-based, uh, salt-based water softening system. And we put that on the makeup water to reduce the minerals as they're entered into the system. So this is a, a very, interesting system in that when they put this on here and they were able to um, eliminate the, uh, any corrosion inhibitors or scale inhibitors. So obviously the scale inhibitors because we're remo removing the minerals, but the corrosion inhibitors, um, because the silica now um, forms a, I am not a chemist, so this is beyond my, beyond my expertise, but the silica was able to uh, perform or form into a different chemicals and act as a scale inhibitor um, and all, or a corrosion inhibitor, sorry, and also um, as a biocide. So there's very little biocide added to the system. 
Um, and this system, uh, they were able to get very high cycles of concentration, 99% um, reduction in blowdown, um, saved significant amount of water, uh, you know, over close to 400,000 gallons of water a year. Um, and because of the in, improved water quality, they were able to get a reduction in their operations and maintenance. Um, basically, they don't have it clean as much. Um, again, they were able to get more uh, free cooling or economizing, water side economizing of the system. Um, and overall, it, it was a successful system. They, they, they like that system. Um, the third one, now, now we're getting into, I think, more advanced systems or less uh, typical systems that you would see. So this is an advanced oxidation potential system. Um, and what it does is it, it uh, generates um, hydrogen peroxide uh, or it uses hydrogen peroxide in ozone. And um, you run that into the cooling tower uh, system, in the cooling tower water, and it, it acts, it inhibits the scale and the corrosion um, and acts as a biocide because you've got, you know, these um, peroxide and hydroxyl ions. Um, so, again, I'm not a chemist, don't ask me to explain how this works, but uh, from a mechanical engineering point of view, um, it, it worked quite well. They were able to get uh, a 26% reduction in the makeup water. Um, the blowdown, so that's a little different than what we were talking about before. Um, the blowdown um, was not measured because we didn't have a meter on the, on the blowdown, we just had a meter on the makeup water. But it was over a million gallons a year saved, so significant savings um, in the system. Um, and a uh, noticeable reduction in the tube fouling when they went in to clean it on an annual basis, they were able to uh, see that there was a, a very significant reduction in, in uh, scaling on, on the tubes, on the condenser tubes. Um, and then they were eliminated all the, you know, other chemicals, except for a small amount of biocide, as, mainly as a precautionary measure. Um, but that system seemed to perform quite well. Um, the fourth system was this, uh, based on an electrolysis uh, method. And so it, it uses in that reactor skid there, you put that in and it treats a, a, a side stream coming off of your cooling tower uh, system and then drops it back into the tower. So it's um, just treating a small amount of water continuously in the system. <clears throat> and what it does is it it preferentially takes this, the minerals out of the system and uh, drops them in these reactors um, through, uh, again, a chemical reaction that I cannot explain to you. Um, but it does. <laughs> It works quite well, and then and I'll show you some pictures of how they were able to remove the scale from the system, um, and it maintains uh, a balanced pH and mineral content to minimize corrosion, and then it just because of the I shouldn't say natural, but you know our in our in our water systems there's uh, usually a, a small amount of chlorine in the system, and with that chlorine it it forms uh, chlorides in the water, and and that acts as a biocide to keep um, biological growth minimized. So this system can be, can be operated without chemical additions, um, but you really have to monitor everything to make sure, because you may have to add a little bit of chlorine uh, to keep the, the biocide or the biological growth under control. Um, so again, we, we monitored, we tested this at two sites, um, site number one, which was in Savannah, Georgia, an office building. Um, we were able to get over 30 cycles of concentration and, and over a million gallons annually saved. And there's a picture on the right there of the reactor when it's, uh, uh, what happened, as I said, the scale forms or precipitates in these reactors. And then you, it's a soft scale. So every, um, you, they monitor it and, and every, you know, three to six months, depending on the amount of your, depending on the mineral content in your water, 
you just take it apart and scrape it off because it's a because it is a soft scale. It's very easy to just scrape off into a bucket or uh, something else, and then you know put the reactor back in in service. Um, uh, the one thing that they really did notice on this system is they had uh, a much improved water quality. So they were able to uh, eliminate uh, two cleanings a year. They they would clean the tower quarterly, um, but with this system, they were able to to just do it um, semi-annually. And so they weren't getting the the biological kind of black film growing in their tower uh, as quickly. Um, which was uh, very nice for the system, obviously. Um, site number two was an office building in, in Los Angeles. Um, again, here we were able to get over a million gallons annually saved. Um, and on the right, bottom right, you can see we took a boroscope into the condenser tubes before and after operation. So the before on the left, you can see significant um, scale on, on, the, on the inside of those tubes. Um, and after operation of the system for, uh, I think, uh, about five months, actually, um, it, it actually removes the scale from the system, which is um, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and um, they also were able to, you know, a noticeable change in scaling on the, on the tower media. So, um, they were able to reduce the number of cleanings on the tower media as well. So that was a huge uh, savings here where you get re eliminated the chemicals and um, and reduce the O&M on the cleaning of your tower. So here's a summary of all the sites. So again, there were five, four technologies over five sites. Um, and there's a wide range uh, in, you know, size and complexity and, um, you know, so it's, it's hard to compare one exactly to the other, but uh, we do have the, the initial costs of the system. Um, the first four were all on GSA sites and uh, there was no um, rebates for those uh, installations. So that cost you know, if you had a, in Colorado, for instance, if each building, um, those those sites would actually be eligible for a significant rebate on those systems through the water system, uh, through the water utility. But because the whole, these were on a federal site with one meter, um, one water meter that served um, multiple buildings. And so you can't, they weren't able, eligible for that rebate for that reason. Um, but they were able to get uh, a, a good payback. Now, the payback here for the uh, four GSA sites is based on um, the average GSA cost of water and sewer across all its buildings uh, in the United States, which is $16.76 per thousand gallons. So that's pretty high, relatively high cost, depending on where you are, um, uh, Los Angeles. So the last one, Los a LA City Hall, only pays ten fifty one. You'd think they might pay more. I think that that will probably go up significantly over the next few years. Um, uh, so, the any other thoughts on here? I think this is a, it's pretty self explanatory. There's a lot of numbers there. All of these. Um, Slides will be made available after um, the webinar, and so you'll be able to download that and, and look at these numbers in more closely and, and analyze them. All right, lessons learned. Uh, really, the, the biggest lesson is performance is very location specific. So just because you know you see somewhere saving 50% or 30%. Uh, for your specific site, uh, it's going to be uh, very dependent on your on your system, what your existing system is, how long your cooling season is, uh, what the water conditions are, and and then obviously what you know you're you're paying for water and sewer costs. Um, one thing that that 
you need to make sure when you know when you do a system like this um, that you do take full advantage of your reduced blowdown on your sewer costs because some sewer costs are automatically charged based on your your makeup water and not you're not measured so make sure you're measuring that blowdown um, or have a offset for um, some kind of offset for reduced blowdown and reduced sewer costs. Uh, make sure, you know, biofilm is extreme, biological growth is extremely important for health impacts. Number one, I didn't put that on here, but that's obvious. But also it is, it really impacts um, your corrosion and uh, scale formation. So um, it's in very important to control that. And that, that means you're going to have to monitor that closely um, until you get that under control. Um, and then some areas, and especially specifically certain times of the year, you'll have a lot of airborne debris, uh, which can really impact your tower. And you're going to have to, you know, clean the tower, uh, put screening up, or some kind of basin sweep that will keep that out of your system. And um, there's no getting around. Sometimes uh, towers take a lot of effort and it's best to, to maintain them and keep them up. Yeah. All right. So some resources, recent resources, again, um, the GSA just recently published in the last month um, a summary of uh, guidance for cooling towers. Um, so you can go to that website and you can get that nice uh, graphic on the right there. But there's also a summer report for this guidance. And then um, if you look at the website, you can find the, the more detailed technical reports on the different technologies that were tested. And then uh, we also just recently published this uh, on the last technology for the Los Angeles City of Los Angeles City Hall. We, we published a report on that. Um, and and that's available at that website. So please uh, reach out. And uh, if you have any questions on those, please feel free to contact myself. Um, and I'll be happy to either answer the question if I can or direct you to someone who can answer your question. All right. That is the uh, end of my this presentation. Please uh, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, submit through the chat box or if you, you have a uh, a question specifically on, on the, what I presented today or uh, on some of the other uh, resources or new um, project results that we, um, or new projects that we presented earlier, or if you have other topics that you would like to see on our next call, please let us know that. So there, and maybe we'll give it a few minutes um, and see if we get any questions come through. Um, doesn't look like there's any right now, but maybe while we wait, I don't know if you want to go back to your results summary, your financial table. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, looks like you're obviously saving, um, <clears throat> no matter what you're saving is uh, definitely dependent on the size of your cooling tower. I was just curious, what do you think the, the greatest factor was? And like, if you look at your, your cooling tower size, um, what do you think the limitations are there? Like, is there a price point where it becomes um, less cost effective to the point where it's not, these technologies are not um, considerable. I feel like 5.5 pay, year payback on the uh, 2400. Yeah. I'm just curious if, <clears throat> if you think that there's a, a limitation to where some of these technologies may, um, are, you know, most suited for builders. Looks like a, you know, 500. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so yeah, the, um, the cost and scalability of these technologies um, does make an impact on performance. So the the last, the electrolysis technology is probably the, mo the more expensive one of this um, and tends to work better on larger systems. Uh, um, however, you know, the, the first site um, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, that was a you know medium-sized system um, had a pretty good payback uh, based on the water um, the average water cost. If you look at Savannah 
water costs are they're actually lower, um, actually around nine or ten dollars uh, per thousand gallons. So, um, but uh, but it did have a significant savings. And what the other reason is that Savannah has a long cooling season. Um, we're in like in Colorado, we have a much shorter cooling season, and some of these um, like the advanced oxidation potential system. Uh, and the salt water based softener system scale up and down very well. So you can go down to a smaller system um, and still get, um, you know, good results. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So from a building owner's perspective, you know, you're trying to decide on a, on a strategy from what you're presenting here. I, I was just trying to, I guess, determine if your, your decision is going to be most heavily weighed on the size of your cooling tower or just, uh, you know, other factors. It looks like, you know, with the electrolysis too, you've got a lot more significant O&M savings. <clears throat> Here we go. There's a, one question mm -hmm. came in. Do you see that? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I'll plug her. Uh, let's see. We've got a question. Uh, do you know what the existing uh, COC was at each site? Uh, the question was, do, do we know what the existing cycles of concentration were at each site? Um, so, Yes, we do, and if I can go back here. Um, so at, um, and I didn't include those, but for, for let's see, for number one, um, this was around, uh, I think, two and a half to three. Um, for number two, again, it was uh, the same thing, around two and a half to three um, cycles of concentration. Um, actually, for number three, I don't know for sure. Um, I have to look that up in the report. Number uh, number four, site number one. Again, that uh, the, the original cycles of concentration here were around three. Um, and for site number two at Los Angeles, it varied significantly to, uh, between like three and five. Uh, and then after, uh, with this technology, it was uh, running between eight and twelve. Thank you. We have another question here, Jason. Um, it's going to be replacing a chiller soon. Uh, the chemical system is getting uh, is also getting replaced. He's wondering um, who to get tasked with in this area, in the Richmond area, Richmond. Uh, I'm sure that we can, um, but yeah, maybe, um, start with the grants, but, you know, these companies do have national representatives. So, um, and if you, I can provide you, I can provide, if you reach out to me with an email, um, email up there, but it, uh, I'll put it. uh, Michael, dot Daru at nrel.gov. I can um, uh, provide in, uh, contact information for for the um, for the each of those companies. Thank you. I just sent that out. I think everybody should be able to see your email address in the um, question responses. Give it a few more minutes here and see if we get any other questions. Um, in the meantime, I might just remind everyone, um, you know, looking ahead, if um, if there's any interest um, or if you have any feedback about your interest in thermal energy storage, <clears throat> um, that's something that I'm working on myself with the Better Buildings group initiative. So I'm going to put my email on here as well. If there's any interest there, I'd like to take your feedback. Uh, let's see. Marcus, do you have anything that you'd like to say in that regard? Uh, if we, um, if there's just no further questions, then I think that we will um, always feel free to reach out to us um, with questions at a later time if they um, come up or you're looking at those reports and, and have some questions. Um, 
And we look forward to seeing you at the Better Building Summit, hopefully, and uh, or at on our next call. And we hope everybody has. Uh, we'll just um, end the call early today and give you all back a few minutes of your day. Enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Um, and we'll we will look forward to uh, our next uh, encounter. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat>